Welcome back to Intro to Philosophy 1010. This is the last uh, video for part two of the book. The fundamental question we are addressing is what is real? And this is the reading by Lisa A. Bergen, and it's entitled Latina Feminist Metaphysics and Genetically Engineered Foods. So, um, this originally appeared in 2009 in an academic journal, uh, the Journal of Agricultural and Environmental Ethics. So um, there is some technical language about uh, DNA and what genes are for genetically engineering foods. You, you won't be tested on that. You know, you have to have a, just the basic knowledge that you can get from this text. So just to have a little bit of a working vocabulary for this reading, uh, if you turn to page 234 at the bottom there, she, the, the last full paragraph, she says, the, biotech, the biotechnology industry organization echoes the University of, University of Nebraska's description of DNA as a universal language. In their guide to biotechnology, they state that Quote, all cells speak the same genetic language. The DNA information manual of, all, of one cell can be read <clears throat> and implemented by cells from other living things. So, end quote. Indeed, the metaphor of DNA as a universal language appears often in pro-GE descriptions of genetic engineering. So GE stands for genetic engineering. Although it is not confined to such accounts, perhaps the most eloquent usage of the metaphor appears in John C. Avis's The Hope, Hype, and Reality of Genetic Engineering, his attempt at a balanced account of both the positive and negative features of genetic engineering. So here is what John C. Avis says. In nature's nucleic acid alphabets, nucleotides are the four kinds of letters, G, A, T, and C, that variously ordered compose every genetic word, sentence, paragraph, and chapter in each organism's operations manual. In the genetic engineering trade, scientists edit these tomes, substituting a biochemical letter here, inserting a word or sentence there, transposing paragraphs, duplicating particular passages, or sometimes the whole text, and in general, attempting to tweak or revamp particular instructions in the code. So, what Lisa Bergen will take issue with is the idea of looking at the gene as a separable unit, she'll say, that can be isolated and transposed from one gene, you know, from one animal to another, from a plant to an animal. Any living being which creates its body when cells divide, the, the genes tell the new cells how to, how to create themselves. It's a it's an uh, instruction manual for how to create new cells. So the structures that the DNA tells cells to replicate themselves in determine the traits of that living being, a short plant or a tall plant, you know, blue eyes or brown eyes. This is all determined by the genetic instructions for, the, for cell division and cell construction. So I don't know you know, the, the details of genetic engineering. So I'm just trying to get the basics that we need to understand the philosophical implications that Lisa Bergen will be talking about. All right, so going back to the beginning of this reading on page uh, 225. All right, so I'll just start reading right at the beginning. She says, the, uh, this first portion of the paper is a philosophical exploration of one reason why many find genetically engineered foods disturbing. We may believe that GE food crops are unnatural. So she'll go on to say, my motivation for analyzing the source of discomfort with GE foods came about after learning about jellyfish DNA being inserted into potato plants so that when the plants need water, they will glow under a special light about spider genes being inserted into goats so that proteins in the goat's milk can be turned into a silk substitute, about fish genes being spliced into tomatoes to make them more cold tolerant, and in each case I thought, yuck, gross, disgusting. And I am not alone. My lefty, organically-minded friends have similar reactions, and it is not uncommon to see these same attitudes reflected in both mainstream and alternative media's referencing of GE technology as producing frankenfoods. So like Frankenstein was created by combining a bunch of parts of dead people 
Similarly, these genetically engineered foods in the popular imagination are kind of monstrous blendings of different parts of nature that shouldn't be blended together. So then she continues to say, in what follows, I will argue that this attitude toward GE foods is anti-feminist and hence inappropriate. This self-critical stance was prompted after reading a blurb from England's Prince Charles, who stated that genetic engineering is, quote, tampering with something very fundamental and attempting, quote, to redesign nature and re-engineer humanity in our image and not God's image. So that's what Prince Charles says. Lisa Bergen says, note how similar the Prince of Wales comments were to my own thoughts at the time, thoughts that I had taken to be consistent with my non-religious feminist philosophy. And yet at base, my disgust with GEOs like the jellyfish potato derived from the belief that these entities are not natural, that we are tampering with nature's fundamental design. Prince Charles is putting this very same opinion in the context of religious belief forced me to take a closer look at my own thoughts. It set me off thinking about what other things religious leaders and politicians believe are unnatural or have believed thus in the past. Women being educated, women working outside the home, women who did not marry, women who did not have or want to have children, gays and lesbians, gays and lesbians who have children, feminists, interracial couples and families, multiracial individuals, the intersexed, transgendered peoples, just as I question church doctrine concerning what is unnatural, maybe I ought to examine my own thinking about the unnaturalness of GE crops. So there you have the context for what will follow. And let me skip to the conclusion so that you'll know where she's heading because uh, this is one of the longer readings and she digs pretty deeply into the human psyche and she brings up Plato. So we've got a lot to cover here. Um, so if you look on page 240 in the conclusion, she says, what I have tried to accomplish in this paper is to replace a poor reason for being wary of GE food with better reasons for doing so. Both opponents and proponents of biotechnology have relied on a logic of purity. So we'll get into what she means by that. Opponents presenting GE foods as monstrous hybrid beings, directing our attention to them as mixed beings that are dangerous because they are impure. And proponents, on the other hand, present these same foods as healthful yet benign beings, directing our attention to them as aggregates of simple, pure unities, meaning genes, that are safe because they are additive composites of safe parts. I am suggesting that we move away from a logic of purity and contemplate plants, their genes, and genetic engineering from a metaphysics that values impurity and resistance. So what she means by resistance uh, will come up when she describes the difference between the logic of purity and the logic of impurity. And um, so, all right, so anyway, that's the beginning and the end. There's the book, the book ends. So now let's get into the essence of her argument. And briefly stated, what she's going to come to the conclusion, her, her conclusion is that she was originally disgusted by the idea of these genetically engineered foods, like mixing a jellyfish with a potato you know, it wasn't a potato that would kind of float around like a jellyfish. It would just had one or I don't know how many genes, but some small trait of a jellyfish that would make the potato glow under a certain light when it needed water so that you won't overwater the potatoes. It's to help, uh, you know, save water and keep potatoes from rotting. So, um, but still, why Lisa Bergen wonders, was I originally disgusted? with that concept. I can understand where I might think it's not a good idea, but how come this visceral reaction, this physical reflex of disgust? Um, and she'll get down into um, Plato's philosophy. She's going, she's going to blame her feeling of disgust on, on the fact that she was unconsciously using Plato's philosophy of pure essences, pure unit, units of being, what Plato called the absolute ideas. And, <clears throat> but uh, I think it's important to point out at the beginning that although Lisa Bergen presents herself 
as you know a, a critic of Plato's philosophy and his metaphysics, which are this, the metaphysics of absolute ideas and souls that exist separately from the body and are imprisoned in the body currently. Um, her solution or her, her antidote to Plato is basically the same philosophy, the same Platonic philosophy that she rejects. Uh, so um, let me read this. We're going to read another feminist philosopher in the next section of the book, Alice Crary, and uh, her reading is A Question of Silence, Feminist Theory and Women's Voices. So she is criticizing fem other feminist philosophers who reject Plato's philosophy, essentially, who reject the idea of, of these categories of thought that are inherent to all human beings. Um, although Alice Crary also rejects aspects of Plato's philosophy, uh, specifically the idea that there are gender, absolute ideas of the genders. She s rejects that, but accepts the idea of absolute concepts other than those. On page 358, the bottom paragraph, Alice Crary says, The worry is that if our current metaphysical conceptions of rationality, experience, and objectivity are understood as presupposing what is male as a norm for all humans, and if we attempt simply to affirm the negation of these traditional metaphysical theses, imagining we are thereby exchanging male basic concepts for female ones, then we end up simply maintaining the structure of that male metaphysics reflected now in the mirror image of its antithesis. Mere denial of the validity of what some philosophers have seen as the metaphysical underpinnings of our most basic concepts will not amount to a dismantling of that tradition. In simply denying some of the central tenets of traditional metaphysics, some theorists recognize it as advancing straightforward tenets which can be denied and thereby limited, limit themselves to a space of alternatives whose dimensions are determined by that tradition. So let me just finish this paragraph. Denial of the correctness of a traditional metaphysical thesis in a sense simply rehearses a moment within the tradition, certain kinds of feminist arguments legitimize traditional male metaphysics in their very attempt to reject it. So that is what I'm going to say is happening with Bergen's article. I'll read that last sentence. Certain kinds of feminist arguments legitimize traditional, and then she uses male in quotation marks, traditional male metaphysics in their very attempt to reject it. How does Bergen legitimize Plato's theory of absolute ideas in her very attempt to reject it? Well, she resorts to the same categorical kind of thinking. She'll call Plato's philosophy the logic of purity, which sees everything can be, which believes everything can be reduced down to fundamental units that can be manipulated and controlled. She'll contrast that to what she calls the logic of impurity, which says that there are no individual units and that everything is dependent on its environment, on its context. So she rejects Plato's dualist metaphysics. There's this material world and there's a spiritual world made of absolute ideas. And yet she creates her own system of dualism, logic of purity, uh, logic of impurity, feminist, the patriarchy. Um, so that is something that is fairly typical of critics of Plato. They tend to use Plato's philosophy while ostensibly rejecting it. And there is um, a quote about that that Lisa Bergen will use and also Alice Crary will refer to, and it's uh, from Audrey Lord, and she says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Alice Crary uses that quote on page 363. So Bergen uses it on page 231, where she says in the, the last sentence on that page, in the words of Audrey Lord, 1984, feminist environmentalists, when we discount GE foods by calling upon the specter of the unnatural mixed being, we are yet again using the master's tools to try to dismantle the master's house. The irony here is in the very process of using that quote, warning others not to use this dualist platonic metaphysics, she is using that dualist 
Platonic metaphysics and does not seem to be aware of it. And um, I think that will become evident. So there's two things to keep in mind while we're reading this essay by Bergen. She's criticizing genetically engineered foods, but she's not for it or against it. She is um, criticizing just her original reaction of disgust towards it. Really what she's criticizing is the dualist metaphysics that Plato uses. That's her real, you know, the, the real enemy that she sees that needs to be overcome. And it will be one of our discussion questions. It's, it's a fundamental point. So let me continue to do, to do an overview of this essay. On page 228, she gets into the issue of natural as normal versus unnatural as abnormal. And she quotes, or she picks up off of the work of another author, Mark Sagoff, who talks about four different types, four different definitions of what we mean by unnatural. All right, so if you look on page 226, um, four separate understandings. This is the second to last paragraph. Sagoff talks about four separate understandings of naturalness. According to this classification, being natural can mean one, belonging to the universe as opposed to being supernatural. Two, having been created by God as opposed to being the profane creation of humans. Three, being independent of human influence as opposed to being artificial. And or four, being authentic as opposed to being illusory, superficial, or deceptive. Um, so the assumption is what is natural is good and what is unnatural is bad. The bottom paragraph on 226, she says, note that Sagoff does not consider the specific issue that I wish to address here while he explores the view by consumers that GE foods are suspicious, potentially risky, and therefore undesirable. He does not analyze the reaction of repugnance to these technologies. So that is what Bergen is interested in investigating. You know, do these different definitions of what is natural explain the disgust reaction that she originally ha uh, had? And she gives some examples, um, you know, artificial. If something's artificial, that's one definition of being unnatural. Well, there's a lot of artificial things. Artificial flavorings, you know, you might think they're unhealthy, but that doesn't explain, you wouldn't be disgusted. It wouldn't make you feel physically you know, have a revulsion, but the idea of mixing spiders and uh, goat genes tends to, you know, we think, oh, that's monstrous. So just because it's artificial doesn't uh, explain the disgust reaction. What about being superficial and illusory? Well, for example, hair dye. People dye their hair. I don't dye my hair. This is obvious, but some people do. That's not disgusting. You're like, okay, that's illusory. You're you know, you might think, oh, that's superficial, but it's not disgusting. So being superficial can't be the reason she felt disgusted. On page 228, she gets down to the essence of her argument, which is that we need to do away with the metaphysics of pure essences. So she says natural as normal versus unnatural as abnormal. Not explored in the above discussion is the fact that GE potatoes differ from so-called natural potatoes in that not only have they been modified, but also they have been altered by the addition of a non-potato element. This leads to another way of thinking about the distinction between natural and unnatural. To be natural is to be true to one's essence. To be a characteristic instance of one's type, to be normal rather than abnormal. In Sagoff's terminology, to be natural is to be authentic or true to oneself. So perhaps we can say that a natural potato is a normal potato and that it has the essence of potato. And the GE potato is an unnatural abnormal potato because its essence is not potato hood, but jellyfish potato hood. This account rests upon a metaphysics that values essences. That's Plato's metaphysics in which an element is coherent, natural, sensical, to the extent that its essential nature is clear, unmixed. In short, it is a metaphysics that values purity. Further, this metaphysics offers a conception of naturalness that can explain my reaction to GE foods as gross and monstrous. It is the combining of the two species that I initially found disturbing. We have mixed together things that nature never intended to be mixed, and we have created entities that lack pure essences. We have confused 
our categories. You want to put what in a potato? Question mark, exclamation, question mark. So she's saying originally she also was following this metaphysics that values essences, and that's why she was disgusted by the idea of mixing a potato with a jellyfish. But then she goes back to say, well, other people who, who use this metaphysics that values essences have found other things to be unnatural, uh, such as women who don't want to get married, women who want to live outside the home, women who don't want to have children. She's a feminist, so she's going through first the feminist reasons to be suspicious of a metaphysics that values essences because it, the essence of a woman is to get married and stay in the home and have children and be subservient to a man. Well, she doesn't want to have anything to do with that kind of a metaphysics, which I, it seems obvious she, she is identifying Prince Charles as being a member of that school of metaphysics that believes in God, or what Plato would call the idea of the good, that orders everything according to these pure absolute essences of things, the essence of tree, the essence of beauty, the essence of justice, but also the essence of anything that you can see, the essence of potato, the essence of a jellyfish. All the jellyfish that you see in the world, according to Plato's philosophy, radiate from the idea of jellyfish, which is itself contained in the idea of the good, in which all of the absolute ideas are united and from which they manifest themselves. So that idea of the good is going to complicate Lisa Bergen's criticism of Plato because while Plato does separate everything into these absolute essences, ultimately he unifies them all again in the ultimate idea of the good, which is very similar to, well, as we'll see, the goddess Kotlikyu of the Nahua religion, which Bergen expresses as you know, a more apt religious idea that values the mixing of everything, the mixing of gender identities, the mixing of races, and maybe potentially the mixing of the genes from different foods, but of that final type of mixing, Bergen remains cautiously suspicious, but I think less disgusted than she originally was. So, she realizes in herself that she was following the same kind of platonic metaphysics that categorizes everything into pure essences. And then she said, but you know what? Still, there's a problem because, for example, on page 229, a little above uh, the middle of the page, she says, consider two examples of mixing non-human categories. Horses and donkeys are bred in order to, to produce mules. Cabbages and turnips were bred in order to produce rutabagas. These sorts of mixing involve conceptually similar entities. Cabbages and turnips are closely related, both members of the Brassica genus. I suppose some may turn their noses up at a rutabaga, you know, but they're not disgusted by them as, as a being. A mule is not, oh, that's a monstrous, what a monstrous hybrid from outer space. No, it's, it's not that disturbing to people because even though a donkey and a horse are different categories. They're very close together on the, the periodic chart of essential elements, which is kind of in our minds, thanks to Plato. Later on in that paragraph, uh, she'll say, uh, comparing a rutabaga to a jellyfish potato, we see that a bit of slight fiddling can be manageable if we conceptualize the original categories as very closely situated within our taxonomies but we do not like our categories messed with, and as more and more disparate categories are combined, we become more and more uneasy. Potatoes and jellyfish, no way. At this point, I have really raised my feminist hackles against myself. The work of feminist philosophers, and especially Latina feminists and other feminists of color, has been absolutely instrumental in showing the flaws with the purity valuing metaphysics underlying these ascriptions of unnaturalness. Okay, so as I said before, sh th this idea of using the master's tools to try to dismantle the master's house, that's Bergen quotes Audre Lorde at the bottom of page 231, saying that that's what she was doing. She was attacking the idea of genetically engineered foods using the very same metaphysics of purity that gave rise to the entire science 
of genetic engineering, which sees everything as can, that can be reduced to these pure essences. Um, but here she is also saying, all right, notice, raised my feminist hackles against myself. So she, originally she was disgusted by the idea of a jellyfish potato. And then she saw Prince Charles, who represents patriarchy and Christianity, espousing the same rejection of genetically engineered foods or genetically engineering anything. And then she realized, oh, it's because I share this metaphysics that values essences of things. I don't like to mix the pure essences that should be kept separate. Oh, but that's the same philosophy that's been used to oppress women and homosexuals and people of color. So then she says, at this point, I've really raised my feminist hackles against myself. So she started with the disgust with the jellyfish potato, and then she reverted to a disgust with Plato's metaphysics that value essences. If she still has this disgust reaction, she's still having this dualist idea, which she is ostensibly renouncing. But in the very act of renouncing dualism, she's creating another polarity between dualism and, and what she's claiming to be of metaphysics that values mixing everything together. And yet if she wants to mix everything together, why call yourself a feminist? Because then you're creating a dualism between feminine and masculine. It's, it's almost impossible to attack Plato's metaphysics using reason because the entire Platonic metaphysics is, tries to define reason as these essential absolute ideas. Reason is able to trace the many material shadows of the absolute ideas back to their ultimate sources, their essences, and that enables us to understand the world around us and the order of things. So if you're trying to use reason to attack the root of reason, which are these, ess these essential concepts, then it's, it's going to be a kind of a, it's going to be a contradictory attempt. And as I think will become more and more apparent. Not that I, th I think her final, Lisa Bergen's final conclusion that we should be, you know, she isolated her own psychology and, and traced it back to Plato's metaphysics. That's deeper than most people go. And then she suggests that we should still be wary of this genetically engineered foods, not entirely against it, but understand that it is, genes are not isolated units, but they're inevitably spliced with their surrounding environment. So we have no idea how it's going to affect. If you change a little bit of a, you know, mix one gene from one species to another, it might create a viable new hybrid species, but we don't know how that species will interact with the other species in which it's introduced. And that's all, that seems like a plausible conclusion, but the, in the, the middle part of analyzing Plato's metaphysics and then rejecting it is contradictory because of what she'll replace it with, as we'll see, especially in the Nahua religion. Um, so I'll start now with these discussion questions and then we'll get into some more of the details about the logic of purity and the logic of impurity. So page 245, discussion question one, compare the discussion of Anzaldúa as Mestiza in Bergen to the discussion of self in Mead and Dubois. So in part one of the book, um, we, we read Mead and Dubois, and they both had similar definitions of the self as a social construct. Mead talked about the self as the object that's an object to itself. How, does, how, how do each of us, who is in we're forced to have our own subjective opinions. How can we gain an objective opinion about ourselves? How can we get out of ourselves and see ourselves? You have to imagine how you appear through the eyes of other people or through the generalized worldview of your society. You, you imagine yourself outside of yourself looking at yourself from other people's perspectives. And therefore, the self is a social construct, says Mead. Dubois assumes the same basic definition of a self, but points out how bad that can be if you're in a society in which you belong to a certain segment of the population that's oppressed and looked down on. 
if the self is becomes what other people perceive you to be well then if other people are perceiving you to be less than human or a sub category of human being then you're obviously going to have problems mead also talked about the self as a reflection of the whole social order in which it emerges so if there's a problem in one part of the social order that will be reflected in each individual self that grows up in that social order that's a lot that's that's very similar to um bergen's idea of the logic of impurity in which everything is dependent on everything else nothing can be really separated down to it's an isolated unit um and for dubois he's also very reminiscent of Anzol Dua's work because she was a mixed American and Mexican, I'm assuming white American and Mexican um, descent. And so the Mexicans disrespected her for being an American and the Americans disrespected her for being a Mexican. And Dubois talks about being a double self, an American and a black American at the same time and having to see himself through the veil of prejudice of how the white world looked at him, which in the white world's perspective was the generalized worldview of the entire nation and how difficult that was for him. It's very similar um, to what Anzal Dua talks about. So on page 229, so after Bergen talks about having raised her feminist tackles against herself, the bottom paragraph, in Borderlands La Frontera, Gloria Anzaldúa explores the emerging of the new Mestiza consciousness. This philosophical account of the human self stands in contrast to a common view of the self in the tradition of Western philosophy. And this, she's talking about Plato. It has envisioned a new personhood, a self that accords with the facts of her own life better than the idealized self, which is centered in the mind, floats above the everyday concerns of specificity, is untroubled by the tumults of the body, is at once anyone and no one in particular, Anzal Dua finds that she is a very specific self, a willful woman, a Chicana, a lesbian. All right, but notice, Anzal Dua finds that she is a very specific self. Well, that is an instance of the logic of purity, which thinks things can be reduced down to pure units. A very specific self is a pure unit. David Hume and the Buddhists do not believe in a very specific self. They think there's just a series of isolated sense impressions and emotions and thoughts. So at any rate, continuing here at the top of page 230, the theme that runs throughout her exploration of herself is that of the mixing of what have been taken to be opposites. As a Chicana, she comes from both indigenous peoples and their European conquerors. As a Texan living in the borderlands, her family is both Mexican, um, when taking a historical view of the geography of her homeland, and American, when taking a more recent view as a strong-willed girl slash woman and a lesbian, she incorporates both masculine and feminine aspects into herself, the hybrid self. She goes on to say she was rejected by Americans as Mexican, by Mexicans as American. She's a mixed self in a land uh, and culture that values purity. So how did she respond to that? The next paragraph, the second full paragraph on page 230, through embracing the Nahua religion, and especially the goddess Kotlikyu, Anzal Dua transforms the denigration associated with mixture into opportunity and value. In her person, Kotlikyu combines seeming opposites. Her figure contains both male and female elements. She is beautiful and horrible. She represents both life and death. Anzal Dua uses Kotlikyu as a model for a self. Continuing down on that paragraph, it is only if we have a dualist metaphysics that separates reality into distinct and opposing elements that the contradictions arise in the first place. At the conclusion of Borderlands, and Zaldua describes her personal journey as unending, she understands the mixed self as positive for her own life. Okay, so she says here, it is only if we have a dualist metaphysics that separates reality into distinct, into distinct and opposing elements that the contradictions arise in the first place. But throughout this entire article, Bergen is using a dualist metaphysics that separates reality into distinct and opposing elements. For example, the feminism that she represents and the religious patriarchy that uh, Prince Charles represents. 
she talks on the top of page 226, the bottom of that top paragraph, and I am not alone. My lefty, organically-minded friends have similar reactions. So she's identifying herself with the left, which is a dualist idea that opposes itself to the right. So it seems so obvious, I don't understand how someone who's doing that could so easily say, it is only if we have a dualist metaphysics to begin with that all the problems start to emerge. Because there's no place in here where that dualist metaphysics um, isn't apparent. And also, as we'll see here, the goddess Kotlikyu is very similar to Plato's idea of the good. So the goddess Kotlikyu combines all the opposites, male and female beautiful and ugly. Well, all of the absolute ideas are combined in the idea of the good according to Plato's cave allegory. So the idea of the good, also the idea of the horrible, the idea of male, the idea of female, everything radiates from that ultimate source of being. And, um, but nevertheless, she's going to go on to specifically mention Platonic epistemology on page 231 but I'll continue here with this analysis of the Nahua religion. So the bottom of page 230, although her multiplicity of self has been denigrated by many around her, and Zaldua celebrates her hybridity as a force of, creative, of creativity personally and potential source of freedom and power socially. She believes that the valuing of mixed cells will also benefit those of us who have been taken as pure. Those folks too are damaged by dualist metaphysics that limit our potential and that mark us all as different from better, worse than each other. So this idea of a dualist metaphysics then giving rise to a hierarchical type of thinking where some people are better and some people are worse. She's, she's against that. However, clearly she thinks people who a spouse, which she will go on to describe as the logic of impurity, are morally superior than those who adhere to the logic of purity. And she's trying, you know, she's writing this article to try to control the way people think about specifically Platonic epistemology, and yet that need to control things is a vice that she says arises from the dualist metaphysics. It's just Important to keep in mind, in her critique of Plato's philosophy, she's actually embracing it and using it. And that is an example, as she's going to go on to say at the bottom of 231, of using the master's tools to try to dismantle the master's house. Okay, so, continuing on the top of page 231, um, she says, And yet, the jellyfish potato rears an ugly head in my psyche, and Zaldua's words help to challenge this reaction to GE foods. The mestizo and the queer exist at this time and point on the evolutionary continuum for a purpose. We are a blending that proves that all blood is intricately woven together and that we are spawned out of similar souls. The mestizo becomes a nahual, a form-shifting shaman, able to transform herself into a tree, a coyote, into another person. She learns to transform the small eye into the total self. Again, the logic of purity believes in separate units. Although Plato's the originator of this philosophy, and all of those separate units, all of the individual souls and all of the absolute ideas that are imprinted on each individual soul, they're all united in the absolute soul or the total self called the idea of the good. So this Nahua religion and this, this, um, you know, this mestizo religion is being presented by Bergen as the antidote to Platonic epistemology when it's really another instance of it. So on the middle paragraph on page 231, she says, according to the Nahua tradition, the universe reality is teotal. Humans are epistemically disadvantaged with respect to understanding Teotl, so epistemology, the study of knowledge. Uh, how can we know anything? What, what, and that's, that's going to be the next fundamental question. What can I know? Um, so our perceptions impede our knowing reality. We perceive reality as made up of static, distinct, and independent elements that we tend to classify and come to understand through marking difference. For example, the male is the opposite of the female. 
Yet these perceptions do not accurately reflect reality, for Teotl is a dynamic life force ever changing, ever becoming an, and unbecoming. Teotl is one, non separable. When humans perceive the universe incorrectly, we perceive Teotl's nahual, or mask, not Teotl itself. Unlike Platonic epistemology, Nahua philosophy does not assert that although knowledge via the senses may be impossible, knowledge is attainable through the mind when properly divorced from the influences of sense perception. Instead, according to Nahua belief, one comes to know Teotl not through the mind, but through the heart. We can know Teotl aesthetically through performances of song, music, and dance. In so doing, we, become, we come to know Teotl in the sense of being at one with reality. So, she noticed the sentence, unlike Platonic epistemology, Nuhu philosophy does not assert that although knowledge via the senses may be impossible. So in other words, Nuhu philosophy does agree with Platonic epistemology that knowledge via the senses is impossible. She had to twist that sentence so as to avoid directly saying that the Nuhu philosophy does say that you cannot know the ultimate reality through your senses, because through your sense perceptions you perceive things to be these distinct units. Um, but how the Nuhua philosophy differs from Platonic epistemology ostensibly is that it says that we cannot know Teotl, which Plato would call the idea of the good, through the mind, but through the heart, specifically through song, music, and dance. And, um, you know, Depending on which Platonic dialogue you read, there's more or less truth to Bergen's criticism. In the Phaedo, I think, her criticism is a lot more fitting when reading Plato's dialogue with the Phaedo. I'll read part of that, and you'll see how it does align, for the most part, with, what, with Bergen's criticism. He's talking, so here, Plato's in the prison waiting his, the hemlock, because he's been sentenced to death for preaching his own philosophy instead of the philosophy, you know, the religion of the state. He's, he was accused of creating his own gods instead of worshiping the gods of the state and for corrupting the youth. He's trying to explain to his friends why he's not afraid to die and why they shouldn't either, uh, be afraid either. And it comes down to his idea of these absolute essences, these pure units of being. So I'll just, um, on page 29, he says, um, then must not true existence be revealed to her in thought, if at all? Yes, and though it is best when the mind is gathered into herself and none of these things trouble her, neither sounds, nor sights, nor pain, nor any pleasure, when she takes leave of the body and has as little as possible to do with it, when she has no bodily sense or desire, but is aspiring after true being, all right, isn't, isn't that when you can see things best when you're not distracted by the body? That is true. Well, but there is another thing, Simeus. Is there or is there not an absolute justice? Assuredly, there is. And an absolute beauty and absolute good, of course. But did you ever behold any of them with your eyes? Certainly not. Or did you ever reach them with any other bodily sense? And I speak not of these alone, but of absolute greatness and health and strength and of the essence of or true nature of everything. Has the reality of them ever been perceived by you through the bodily organs, or rather is not the nearest approach to the knowledge of their several natures made by him who so orders his intellectual vision as to have the most exact conception of the essence of each thing which he considers? So that is this logic of purity that Bergen is talking about. Is, don't you have the truest knowledge of the nature of everything when you can order your intellectual vision so as to have the most exact conception of the essence of each thing. And then he'll go on to say, and he attains to the purest knowledge of them who goes to each with the mind alone, not introducing or intruding in the act of thought, sight, or any other sense together with reason, but with the very light of the mind in her own clearness, uh, searches into the very truth of each. He who has got rid as far as he can of eyes and ears, and so to speak of the whole body, these being, in his opinion, distracting elements, which, when they infect the soul, hinder her from acquiring truth and knowledge, who, if not he, is likely to attain the knowledge of true being. So that is a good example of what Bergen was talking about. Um, if you read at the bottom of page 229, she's talking about how Anzal Dua developed a new con conception of the self that is in opposition to the standard traditional Western philosophy, 
It has envisioned a new personhood, a self that accords with the facts of her own life better than the idealized self, which is centered in the mind, floats above the everyday concerns of specificity, is untroubled by the tumults of the body, is at once anyone and no one in particular. And Zaldua finds that she is a very specific self, a willful woman. So she's interpreting Plato's philosophy to say, well, if we're not the body and each of us is just this fundamental atom of consciousness, how can you differentiate one from another? I'm a very specific self, not, you know, one unit that's cut from this ultimate unit, the supreme self. And yet, as we saw, that is the Nuhua religion where you transform the small I into the total self. We saw that at the top of page 231. And also, um, if you read other Platonic dialogues, then this idea of learning through reason is, you know, yes, you should try to uh, learn about these absolute essences using reason. But Plato said in the Phaedo on page 65 that we should have um, a hesitating confidence in human reason. A hesitating, yeah, a hesitating confidence in human reason, not this absolute faith in human reason. And in another dialogue from the laws, so it was Plato's last dialogue, or maybe second to last dialogue, here's how he describes um, through this person called the Athenian stranger. Socrates isn't present in this dialogue. He says, uh, why I mean we should keep our seriousness for serious things and not waste it on trifles, and that while God is the real goal of all beneficent serious endeavor, man, as we said before, has been constructed as a toy for God, and this is, in fact, the finest thing about him. All of us, then, men and women alike, must fall in with our role and spend life in making our play as perfect as possible to the complete inversion of current theory. We should pass our lives in the playing of games, certain games, that is, sacrifice, song, and dance, with the result of ability to gain heaven's grace and to repel and vanquish an enemy when we have to fight him. So, playing games to, for the pleasure of God, sacrifice, song, and dance, that seems um, a lot like the Nahua religion that... And Zaldua describes, and that Bergen is proposing as kind of an antidote to Platonic epistemology. About discussion question one, comparing the Nuhua religion to Mead. Mead thinks because the self is a social construct, each of us is inherently, has multiple personalities. And that is also in line with the Nuhua religion, the goddess Kotliku. She's the unity of all the different personalities, and she in herself combines all these unifies the polar opposites, just like, however, Plato's idea of the good. Okay, so, um, in discussion question two, it says, what are some of the similarities and differences between Nahua philosophy and traditional European philosophy, such as Plato's explained? So, if this is included as one of the questions on the exam, uh, you, you only have to compare the Nahua philosophy to Plato's philosophy because that's really the only philosophy that Bergen discusses. And it just makes this a lot easier, uh, a lot easier for me to grade and a lot easier for you to write. So we've already gone over some of the similarities and um, the differences. So there's more similarities between Plato's philosophy and the Nuhua philosophy than there are differences. The similarities are that Plato's idea of the good is very similar to the goddess Kotlaku and like the Nuhua religion, um, each of us little selves or little souls is emanating from the total self or soul, which Plato calls the idea of the good. And, um, and as I read from the laws about Plato saying that we, we're toys that God plays with and that we should use song and dance to uh, unify ourselves with God's will on page 231. Um, instead, according to Nahua belief, one comes to know Teotl not through the mind, but through the heart. We can know Teotl aesthetically through performing performance of song, music, and dance. In so doing, we come to know Teotl in the sense of being at one with reality. So, I th Bergen thinks that the Nuhua philosophy is the opposite of Plato's epistemology because it emphasizes the union of opposites. 
And you can read that in Plato's epistemology, but as it develops and culminates with the idea of the good, then it's a lot like the goddess Kotlikyu. So Plato overcame his own dualism by unifying the spiritual world of eternal forms of knowledge and the material world, which are made of the shadows of these absolute forms, he united them in the idea of the good. Um, a difference between Plato's philosophy and Nuho religion, I don't know if the Nuho philosophy talks about reincarnation, but Plato certainly did. And also Plato talks about political structure and the need for the political leaders to have this ultimate vision. Um, but there is a kind of a hierarchy in the Nahua religion because you can become a Nahual, a sh form shifting shaman, who I would assume to be someone who has more respect in society, someone who's had opened the eye of the soul to the idea of the good, or opened their soul to um, a vision of the goddess Kotlikyu. All right, so on page 246. Question number three, explain the distinction Bergen makes between the logic of purity and the logic of impurity. The logic of purity likes to split complex things into their pure essential units, which can then be hierarchically arranged. The logic of impurity does not like the idea of hierarchy, and the one way to get rid of the idea of hierarchy, of one thing being better than another, is to say there are no individual things, so there's no way you can rank them. And yet, clearly... Bergen is taking the logic of impurity as being morally and metaphysically superior to the logic of purity, which is itself an expression of the logic of purity, which brings me back to um, Alice Crary on page, I believe it was 358. This will now make more sense. <clears throat> she says, um, if if we attempt simply to affirm the negation of these traditional metaphysical theses, imagining we are thereby exchanging, quote, male, unquote, basic concepts for female ones, then we end up simply maintaining the structures of that male metaphysics reflected now in the mirror image of its antithesis. At the bottom of that paragraph, she says, certain kinds of feminist arguments legitimize traditional male metaphysics in their very attempt to reject it. That is exactly what Lisa Bergen is doing when she contrasts Platonic epistemology and the logic of purity with the Nahua religion and the logic of impurity. That doing that, creating that polarity, is just the mere opposite of the logic of purity. It's doing the same thing, it's just inverting the hierarchy while claiming to do away with hierarchies. The irony that Bergen points out about the logic of purity is that it can be used to both attack genetically engineered foods and to support them. It can be used to attack them because, like the example she used, we don't like our taxonomies of the absolute ideas which she originally discovered she had in her, in her own mind. We don't like things that are too far apart on this categorical chart, this um, you know, the periodic table of elements, you've got your hydrogen, oxygen, all these different atoms listed in this chart. Well, it seems like we have a similar chart in our minds of these absolute essences of things. You can combine two separate essences if they're close on the chart, like, um, you know, uh, what was it, a, a donkey and a horse to make a mule. But if you have a jellyfish way over here and a potato way over here, that's, they're too far apart and that triggers this disgust reaction. However, the same logic of purity can say, no, 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 you're looking at it on the wrong scale of things. Let's go down to the genetic scale, and each gene can be separated into these, you know, each physical trait that a living being has can be corresponded, can be linked to a specific gene. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence, and these units of heredity remain pure. Each of them is, is pure in itself, and if you mix them like letters in a sentence, they remain pure. Anything you do with them remains pure because genes are pure. So that's, she'll point out how you can use the logic of purity to attack or support genetically engineered foods. Discussion question four asks, explain the cookbook analogy in Bergen's evaluation of its use. So some of the 
proponents of genetically engineered foods um, said it's like taking, you know, when you take a gene from one species and put it in another, it's like taking one recipe from one cookbook and putting it in, an, in another. So the recipe remains self-contained. It doesn't infect the other recipes in the cookbook and everything's fine. But what Bergen points out, and I think she's, it, she makes a very good point, um, if you look about three quarters of the way down on page 236, she says, rather than picturing a one-to-one -one correspondence between gene and trait, genes and the cells they exist within will now be conceptualized as curdled together. This is using the logic of impurity. Working in consort with one another to produce the traits exhibited by the individual. Now, transporting a gene into another species is less akin to copying a new recipe in a cookbook and more akin to adding a new ingredient into a recipe. This new ingredient will then interact with the other ingredients to produce a result that may or may not be what we are expecting. I recall the time my partner thought she was adding cornstarch to a stir fry, but instead added baking soda. Rather than thickening her sauce, she made it fizzy and inedibly salty. She changed the very, the very character of the meal. So that is what the cookbook analogy is supposed to show, that you can't, the genetic code of a, of an animal isn't like a recipe that's self-contained and, and doesn't interact with other recipes. It's like taking one of the ingredients out of one recipe and slipping in another ingredient. Now you've changed the whole thing. So I will just read again the conclusion of her article, and I think it'll make more sense now after this hour-long review. On page 240, she says, what I have tried to accomplish in this paper is to replace a poor reason for being wary of GE food with better reasons for doing so. Both opponents and proponents of biotechnology have relied on a logic of purity. Opponents presenting GE foods as monstrous hybrid beings, directing our attention to them as mixed beings that are dangerous because they are impure. Proponents, on the other hand, present these same foods as healthful yet benign beings directing our attention to them as aggregates of simple, pure unit, unities that are safe because they are additive composites of safe parts. I am suggesting that we move away from a logic of purity and contemplate plants, their genes, and genetic engineering from a metaphysics that values impurity and resistance. The last sentence, the last two sentences on page 240, she says, conceptualizing genes under a logic of impurity could allow us to retain the concept of the gene and yet hold within our understanding of it that it is curdled or curdled within a larger context, genes become identifiable and yet inseparable elements of their environment. Perhaps this Latina feminist metaphysics can be a point along our way to new understandings of how life works. Okay, so that concludes part two of our book, which was asking what is real and we saw Lisa Bergen talking about what is real food. Is a jellyfish potato real or is it somehow fake? Can anything be fake? At any rate, we, we got into the details of her answer to the question. The next part of the book, part three, is going to be discussing the fundamental question, what can I know? And we will come back with that.